All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we are gonna talk about the structure of skeletal muscle. All right, so first off, before we start even getting into this diagram, I wanna talk a little bit about muscle. So what are some of the characteristics of muscles? So what I want you guys to remember uh, with muscles is that there are four characteristics that make muscle tissue a little bit different from other tissues. So for example, one of those four characteristics, so if we were to go here in order, one, two, three, Four. The first thing about muscle that's really, really spe special about it is that it's excitable. So it's one of the few tissue cells, this and neural tissue, that it's excitable. So what do I mean by excitable? Let's say here I have just an actual muscle cell. Here's our muscle cell, okay? And then serving it is some gonna be some type of motor neuron. Okay, so here's our actual motor neuron. This motor neuron is actually going to be responsible for stimulating this muscle cell. How? By releasing specific chemicals that we'll talk about in more detail at the neuromuscular junction, they release out neurotransmitters. For example, in this case, acetylcholine. And what does this acetylcholine do? It stimulates this muscle cell. And what does this muscle cell in response to that do? It generates a change in membrane potential. So it undergoes what's called an in-play potential and an action potential, right? So that's one thing about muscles as they're very excitable. So they can respond to some type of stimulus, usually a neural stimulus, and they change their membrane potential in response to that. Another thing about that is when their membrane potential changes and they develop what's called an action potential, that action potential can be propagated along the actual muscle cell membrane and eventually trigger this muscle cell to shorten. What does that mean whenever it can shorten forcibly due to frequent or uh, adequate amount of stimulation? That's called contractility. So muscles also have contractility. So they're contractile. So one thing about muscles is that they have the ability to be excited. So they can be stimulated by some neural stimulus. In response to that, they can develop a membrane potential. That membrane potential can then cause this muscle cell to shorten forcibly. And when it does that, due to adequate stimulation, it can contract. So it's contractile. You know what else is really cool about muscle? It has the ability to be stretched appropriately. So you don't want to be able to stretch a muscle too much, but it does have the ability to stretch beyond its normal resting length. So for example, if I have a muscle here, let's say here's a muscle, okay? Here's this muscle, and this is at its resting length, okay? This is at rest. What I'm gonna do is, I'm going to stretch this muscle. So what would that do to this muscle? It's going to allow for this muscle to be a little bit longer, to be stretched beyond its normal capabilities. So this ability to stretch the muscles, so this is rest and this is stretched. So the ability to stretch this muscle beyond its normal resting point allows for the muscle to be very distensible or extensible, okay? So we can use the word distensibility or extensibility, okay? So it's extensible, just meaning stretchable, okay? Another characteristics of muscle tissue is the fact that it's elastic though too, okay? So it's also elastic. And we'll talk about that when we talk about these connective tissue coverings. So it has elasticity. What is elasticity? Elasticity is, for example, we can say two different types of definitions. One of them is whenever you try to stretch a muscle or any type of tissue, let's just say any type of tissue for right now, I stretch that. When I stretch it, it resists that one desire to want to stretch. It always wants to recoil and go back to the smallest size possible. So when you think about that, me trying to stretch something and it's resisting it, that's elasticity. That's also a, one of the characteristics of muscle tissue. Okay, so these are some of the muscle characteristics Okay, now we're gonna go over a lot of these different uh, function of these actual muscles. For example, we'll go over contraction with the neuromuscular junction, the excitation contraction coupling. But just for right now, what are four main functions of muscle? If we were to just for right now go over four main functions of muscle, just the overall concept of it. The four major functions that encompass our muscles, you know, basically their function is going to be, one is the ability to produce locomotion. What does that mean? You know, if I wanna be able to move my arm up, it depends upon the muscles contracting and pulling all my skeletal bones, 
So because of that, it's responsible for moving the skeleton or producing locomotion. So I'm just going to put producing movement. Producing movement of our skeleton, so locomotion. Another thing, for me to be able to, while I'm standing, to maintain this posture, okay, or stability, my body position, to maintain my posture against gravity, because gravity is trying to push me down. In order for me to be able to maintain my posture and stand up straight and have normal body position, I have to have those muscles there that are stabilizing that. Okay, so because of that, we also need the muscles to help us with our posture and stabilization, right? So it helps to maintain our posture. Another thing is it wraps around many different types of joints. So because it's wrapping around joints, joints are naturally stable on their own, right? Because usually bones are connected with ligaments and other different types of structures, right? Connective tissue structures. But muscles help to stabilize those joints even more. So another function of muscles is they stabilize a lot of our body's joints. And another thing, they help with temperature. Okay, so they help to be able to produce or generate heat. You can think about that, I like to think about that just in general, muscles are constantly, whenever we actually uh, undergo cellular respiration, one of the byproducts of cellular respiration is heat production. Also, I like to think about if you're really, really cold, what does your body try to do to be able to compensate for that cold? It shivers. Whenever you shiver, the contractions aren't, com aren't complete contractions, so those quivering contractions help to be able to generate some heat. Okay, so that's one of the functions also of muscles. So just a real quick recap. Just remember the general characteristics of muscle, that it's excitable, so it can receive a neural stimulus, and it can respond by having a membrane potential. If that membrane potential is adequate enough to produce an action potential, the muscle can shorten forcibly, which is called contractility. On top of that, it can be stretched beyond its normal resting length, right? And that's because it's extensible, okay? So you can think about sometimes eccentric contractions. We'll talk about that later. Elasticity is it has the ability to be stretched, right, but I'm, I should actually rephrase that, El specifically elasticity is once you want to reduce stretch. You don't want, you want to resist the change in the stretch. It wants to recoil and assume the smallest size possible. And also that functions, it likes to produce locomotion, maintain posture and body position against anti-gravity you know, anti effects, helps to stabilize certain types of muscle joints. Think about the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a very good stabilizer of the actual shoulder joint the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. You can remember sits, okay? And it's also responsible for being able to generate heat to maintain certain types of body temperature. For example, when we're really cold, we shiver to generate some heat. Okay, so that's that. Now what I wanna do is I wanna zoom in on the actual overall macroscopic structure of the skeletal muscle, and then we'll work our way down from macroscopic to microscopic. Okay, so let's do that. So here we have a big old skeletal muscle. So for example, this is the femur. So let's just say it's one of the actual quadriceps muscles, right? One of the actual muscles there, coming off of the actual femur. And what this muscle is going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to take this, slice it in half, and we're going to look at it in this view. So for example, this is the whole muscle belly. All I'm doing is I'm cutting this piece and opening up so we can see what it looks like inside of it. Okay, so I'm making this transverse cut and I'm flipping it over. Now when I do that, you have to realize something. There's actually a nice little connective tissue covering right over this muscle belly. You see all this right here? We actually peeled it back for you guys to see. So we peeled this little part here back. So if you guys can see right here, this little connective tissue structure, it's actually peeling, we're peeling it back from this actual muscle belly. So this whole thing in here is the muscle belly. Surrounding this muscle belly is a little connective tissue covering right there. This connective tissue covering, I'm gonna come from the top here because it's this whole thing here. We're just peeling that piece back. This is called the epimysium. Okay, this is called the epimysium. Now the epimysium is a dense fibrous, let's actually write that down, that'd be good to know. It's a dense fibrous irregular, I'm gonna put IR, connective tissue. Okay, so it's very, very tough. They also call it, you know, your white fibrous tissue, right? So it's a very, very tough connective tissue. So that's gonna be one of the connective tissues. So this is actually gonna be dense fibrous irregular connective tissue. And again, it's actually gonna be actually uh, connected right onto the actual large muscle belly. All right, that's one part. And also, we'll talk about this in a second, 
that this actual uh, epimysium in certain types of uh, situations, very not as common as tendons, and we'll talk about that, it can actually fuse to the periosteum of the bone and form like direct fleshy attachments with the bone. We'll talk about that in a little bit though. All right, so now what I did is, okay, so we have the epimysium, right, the connective tissue covering right around this whole muscle belly, a, a, a section of that muscle belly. Inside of that muscle belly, you see a whole bunch of bundles of muscle fibers. So you see this bundle right here, this is a bundle consisting of muscle fibers, this is a bundle consisting of muscle fibers, and this is a bundle, 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 bundle. These bundles of muscle fibers are called fascicles, okay? So this bundle right here of muscle fibers, this bundle is called a fascicle. So a fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers, okay? Now, surrounding the fascicle, is another connective tissue layer. So for example, we just blew up one of the fascicles. We blew up one of these fascicles, and if you see, there's a nice little black connective tissue covering around that fascicle right there. We peeled that piece back again for you. So you see a little connective tissue covering around this, and we peeled a piece back around this fascicle? This part right here, this connective tissue, is actually called the perimyceum. Okay, it's called the perimyceum. Now the perimyceum, just like the epimyceum, they're actually continuous with one another. And that's gonna be very important. I'll explain why that's important in a second. But the perimyceum is a nice, dense, fibrous, irregular connective tissue, just like the epimyceum. Okay, so it's a nice, dense, fibrous, irregular, I'm gonna put IR, connective tissue. So really, really cool stuff there, all right? And again, what I said is that this actual perimyceum, the epimyceum, and this last one that we're gonna talk about, the endomyceum, are all continuous with one another. All right, so now, this is a fascicle. This is a fascicle, 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 fascicle. The whole thing is a muscle belly, okay? What I'm gonna do now is, I'm gonna take out of this fascicle, I'm gonna pull one of these structures out, this tube. You see this tube that I pulled out? This is a muscle fiber, okay? So this one right here is specifically called a muscle fiber. Now, sometimes you might hear the word muscle fiber and muscle cell used interchangeably because they are the same thing. A muscle fiber and a muscle cell is the same exact thing. Okay. This muscle fiber, so you can see that there's tons and tons of muscle fibers within this bundle of these structures. Bundle of muscle fibers in here, it's called a fascicle, right? An individual structure here is a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. Now there is another connective tissue covering surrounding this actual muscle fiber, another connective tissue, but it's not as tough of a connective tissue. There's a connective tissue, this black connective tissue, we peeled a little bit of back, it might be hard to see, but there's another little connective tissue that we peel back surrounding this muscle fiber, and that is called the endomyceum. Endomyceum. Now the endomyceum is an areolar connective tissue. So it's, a, it's not as tough, it's not as, a, it's not as tough and actual resistant and resilient as compared to the dense fibrous irregular connective tissue. Because you know areolar connective tissue, it has a little less collagen as compared to this dense fibrous irregular connective tissue. Okay. We'll talk about this next thing in another video, the next video where we discuss the neuromuscular junction. But the endomyceum is covering this muscle fiber. There's what's called the plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane is actually covered by this endomyceum. So there is a plasma membrane, it's here in red. The muscle fiber is surrounded by a structure called the sarcolemma. And we will talk about this in the neuromuscular junction video. But again, don't get this confused with the endomyceum. The endomyceum is wrapping over the sarcolemma. Okay, so this is actually the plasma membrane. So this is your phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so don't get that confused with the endomyceum. Okay, so the muscle fiber is surrounded. Let me actually make that clear. It's surrounded by this sarcolemma. Surrounded by this sarcolemma, all right? So it's surrounded by the sarcolemma, which is this plasma membrane, which is again, a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now we have all of these actual connective tissue coverings, right? And again, to recap, surrounding the muscle belly is the epimyceum, which is dense fibrous irregular connective tissue. 
in this whole muscle belly, you have multiple fascicles. And these fascicles are just bundles of muscle fibers. Each individual fascicle is covered by another connective tissue. And that connective tissue is the same connective tissue as epimysium. It's dense fibrous irregular connective tissue, but we call it perimysium, okay, because it's covering these fascicles. Then in each individual fascicle is many, many, many muscle fibers or muscle cells. These muscle fibers, each individual one is covered by another connective tissue, which is an areolar connective tissue called the endomysium. But un surrounding this, you know, you have the endomysium surrounding this muscle fiber. This muscle fiber or cell has a membrane called the sarcolemma. It's the plasma membrane, a phospholipid bilayer that's underneath the endomysium. All right, now I told you that all of these structures, the endomysium, the perimysium, and the epimysium are all con continuous with one another. And what I mean by that is, <coughs> you know how we have this actual tendon here? Let's say this is the tendon. So here's a tendon connecting the muscle. What is a tendon? By definition, what is a tendon? So this right here is a tendon, but a tendon is a rope-like connective tissue rich and rich in collagen. So what does that mean? So what that means is that collagen is very resilient, right? So it's very resilient, very tough. So what this tendon is doing is it's connecting the muscle to the bone. Now here's what's really cool. When this muscle fiber contracts, so let's say we take this individual muscle fiber, it contracts. When it contracts, it pulls on the endomysium. What did I tell you? All of these structures are continuous. So if this actual, what? This muscle fiber contracts, what does it do? It pulls on the endomysium, it pulls on the perimysium, it pulls on the epimysium. And if that's the case, then it's pulling on all these connective tissue sheets. What is that gonna do? This can actually be connected with a tendon and the tendon is what's connecting the muscle to the bone. So one more time, if the muscle fibers contract, they pull on the endomysium, the perimysium, and the epimysium. When they pull on that, they pull on the tendon. And if they pull on the tendon, what is that gonna do to the bone? It's going to move it. So that is the function of these actual connective tissue sheaths. So again, one more time, let's actually kind of follow it in like a flow pattern. Muscle contracts. So let's say that the muscle fibers contract. What does that do to the connective tissue sheaths? All the endomysium, epimysium, and paramysium. The connective tissue, I'm gonna put CT, sheaths are pulled on, okay? When they're pulled on, they're going to pull on a result, the tendons. So they're gonna pull on tendons. And when you pull on the tendons, what is that gonna do to the bone? It's gonna pull on the bone and move the bone. And what's that gonna produce? Locomotion, right? So it's going to pull or move And obviously, depending upon the type of muscle, it also depends upon what's called insertion and origin. What is, what is meant by insertion and origin? So let's say I take, for example, simple muscle. Let's say I take the masseter, okay? So let's say I take the masseter. So here I have my masseter muscle. Now, just to be really simplistic here, there's two bones that the masseter is generally connected to. Let's say here's one bone, and let's say here's the other bone, okay? Just a crude diagram. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link this muscle up between these two bones, because that's really what's happening. This muscle is being, you know, a, connect a connection between these bones. And then what's happening is I'm having a tendinous connection. Let's show that here in this blue. So let's say I have a tendinous connection here and a tendinous connection right here. Let's say this bone that this masseter muscle is connected to is the zygomatic bone. So this one up here is the zygo matic bone and this bone down here is the mandible so let's say this is the mandible when the muscle is contracting and again what is this muscle here called this muscle is called the we're just taking the masseter muscle as an example it's one of the muscles that helps in chewing what's called mastication what happens is we have to determine what's the insertion and what's the origin I'm gonna write it down for right now and I'm gonna explain why okay so if that's the case, I'm gonna to explain to you 
It's going to make more sense after I get it all done. The mandible is actually moving. That's the function of the masseter. So the masseter helps to pull the mandible up, elevate the mandible. So I think about in this position, and I'm going to elevate it. That's the job of the masseter. So it's moving the mandible up. So if that's the case, this is the one that's moving. Nothing happened to my zygomatic bone. I didn't move that bone. It stayed still. So it stayed still. It's not moving. If that's the case then, what happens is when a muscle contracts, the part of the bone that's not moving is referred to as the origin. Okay? And then the part that's actually moving is referred to as the insertion. What happens is when a muscle contracts, it moves from insertion to origin. But again, what is connecting this muscle to the bones? The tendons. But you know that's not all that's connecting them? Besides tendons, you have other examples of these connective tissue sheaths in your body. For example, on the top of the head. First one that you know, I can think of, or within the actual abdomen. They're sheaths, all right? They're sheaths of actual connective tissue. So a tendon, imagine a tendon is like a rope. It's a rope-like connection between the muscle and the bone. So this would be an example of a tendon. Another one is like this. Imagine a sheet. So imagine an actual sheet. This is an example of an aponeurosis. So an aponeurosis is a sheet-like connective tissue that's connecting muscle to bone. A tendon is a cord, okay, or a rope-like connective tissue that's connecting muscle to bone. All right, so now again, what do we cover here? We said all of these connective tissue sheaths are important because when a muscle fiber contracts, it pulls on the connective tissue sheaths, which pull on the tendons, which pull or move the bone. Depending upon what the tendons are connected to determines the actual direction, right? So for example, if we say the tendons are connected to the mandible and they're also connected here to the zygomatic bone, right? What's gonna happen? Well, the mandible is not the part that's actually, it's the, it's the part that's actually moving. So whenever the muscle contracts, it moves that bone up. That must be the insertion. This point where the tendon is actually connecting is not moving. Okay, that point is not moving, that's fixed. So that has to be the origin. An insertion always moves towards the origin. Now, another thing. You know these connective tissue sheaths? They also contribute to elasticity. What do I mean by elasticity again? Elasticity is that ability to resist that change in the actual stretch or deformation. And the reason why is because it's a dense, fibrous, irregular connective tissue. They're not very good at allowing for stretch. All right, so now, you know, these connective tissue sheaths, you know what's also really important with these connective tissue sheaths? Because it's dense, fibrous, irregular connective tissue, those types of connective tissue want to resist the stretch. They constantly want to be able to pull the muscle and maintain its normal size. They don't like being stretched. So because of that, they contribute to elasticity. So another function of these connective tissue sheaths, you know, again, the endomycium, perimycium, epimycium, these connective tissue sheaths are contributing to elasticity. I'll say they, they're contributing to elasticity, and that's really important. And another thing that actually happens is, you know, these actual uh, dense fibrous irregular connective tissue is decently vascularized, not superiorly vascularized, but it's enough vascularization so they do have blood vessels that are running through there and nerve fibers that are running through these connective tissue sheaths. Those three functions I want you guys to remember for connective tissue sheaths. One, when a muscle contracts, the muscles pull on the sheaths. Those pull on the tendons which pull or move the bone. Second thing, I want you to know that they contribute to elasticity. So they want to prevent the actual or resist the desire of the muscle to be stretched. They want it to recoil. They want to assume the smallest size possible. Third thing I want you guys to remember besides that is also that blood vessels and nerve fibers are running through these connective tissue sheaths. All right, last thing and then we're going to go into the sarcomere. Another thing that's really important is understanding how muscles are connecting to bone because muscles can connect to bone in two ways. Okay, let's, let's go over that quick now. Okay, so there's two ways in which the muscle connects. So how can these muscles, so muscle to bone connection. Two ways. One way is a direct attachment. Okay, the second way 
is indirect. Out of these, this is less common. This is not as common. So this is less common. And this is much, much, much more common. Many of the ways that we are actually connecting our bones to muscles, it's through indirect connections. We've already talked a little bit about them. The direct connection and simple, to make it the most simple as possible. All it is is, is this, this connection from the epimysium to the bone. So an epimysium is fusing with the bone, specifically what structure of the bone. So epimysium is dense fibrous irregular connective tissue. There's another connective tissue that's actually clinging directly to the bone. And this connective tissue that's clinging directly to the bone is actually called periosteum. So what happens is whenever the periosteum is fusing with the epimysium, that is a direct fleshy attachment. Another thing though, you know that uh, at the end of our bones usually, usually you have a hyaline cartilage, hyaline cartilage that's actually you know right here, and then there's actually gonna be this actual dense fibrous irregular connective tissue that's surrounding that. So if that's the case, what's that called? That's called perichondrium. So you have a periosteum or a perichondrium. Any direct connection between the epimysium and the periosteum or the perichondrium is a direct connection. Okay, that's a direct connection. So let's write that one down. So any direct connection, which is less common, is going to be epimysium fusing with the periosteum or it's fusing with the perichondrium. Okay, that is an example of a direct or fleshy attachment, not as common. The indirect ones are much, much more common. I'll, I'll give you two reasons why. These indirect connections are mediated through tendons, which we already talked about, and aponeuroses, which we already talked about. Okay, I want you guys to think logically here about why tendons and aponeuroses, more commonly tendons, are more common for a connection between muscle to bone. All right, first reason, tendons are much smaller, okay? So because tendons are a lot smaller, they're gonna conserve more space. So that's one reason why the indirect connections are better. So one reason why indirect connections are better, so let's say here we have indirect uh, connections or attachments. One reason why is it conserves space. Because tendons are much, much smaller than these having these direct fleshy attachments. That's one reason, simple reason. Second reason, a little bit different. The other reason is actually because it's very resilient or tough. Okay, so that's one reason, it's very resilient. What do I mean by that? So you know these tendons are actually going to be uh, undergoing a lot of uh, rubbing between the bone, all right? So whenever the bones are actually moving, right? So whenever the bones are moving because of the skeletal muscles allowing for them to contract, those tendons might actually have a little bit of friction against the bones. What happens is, is if that was fleshy connections, those would completely get fricked up, all right? They would get destroyed in that kind of situation. So they're not very good in that situation because Tendons are a lot of collagen connective tissue. So it's a lot of collagen, what does that mean? If there's a lot of collagen, it's very, very tough, very, very resilient, and it's able to be able to allow for the bones to rub up against it and not actually break apart, right? So that's one reason. So a good thing for indirect connections is that they're very small, so they conserve a lot of space. Second reason is that they can resist a lot of abrasion and friction whenever the bones rub up against it. Okay, that's, that's the second reason. So two reasons why is because it's very resilient because of the collagen connective tissue. And because of that, it can undergo resistance against abrasion whenever the bones are rubbing up against it. Second reason is they're small and they conserve space. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take and look here for a second. This is our muscle fiber, our muscle cell, right? That was covered with the endomycium. And underneath the endomycium was the plasma membrane, which is the sarcolemma. Now, that muscle cell consists of thousands upon thousands of these little structures here. What is this structure right here called? This structure right here is called a myofibril. Okay, a myofibril 
is consisting of tons and tons of proteins. Now, a myofibril, again, like I said, you can have hundreds to thousands of these myofibrils within one muscle cell. And also these muscle cells, you'll notice that they have this blue structure around them. We'll talk about that in the neuromuscular junction video, but that is gonna be super, super important. I'm gonna write it down for right now. It's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's a nice factory of calcium. And we'll see why whenever we talk about that with respect to the T-tubules. Also, you notice that these skeletal muscles are very cylindrical. Okay, so each skeletal muscle fiber is very cylindrical and it's multinucleated. Okay, so again, remember this for the skeletal muscles. I want you to remember that they have a nice little filamentaceous uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is kind of like a derivative of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's a calcium storage factory. It's going to have a cylindrical shape and it's going to be striated. I should write that down. That's an important thing to write down. So another thing about these actual muscle fibers or cells is that they're striated. So what is meant by striated? It means that it takes on like a striped appearance. And that's what we're gonna look at in this situation here. This whole big beast that we're having over here and you guys are probably wondering about, this big beast over here is actually the functional and structural unit of the muscle cell. It's actually called the sarcomere. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next video. All right, so what we're gonna do in the next video, guys, is we're gonna go over a little bit more detail on this actual uh, specific myofibril consisting of this sarcomeric structure. All right, so I'll see you guys in the next video in part two where we talk about a little bit more about the actual sarcomere.